City bus riders are being warned to have a backup plan for Monday as Transit Windsor braces for a possible strike. Plus, a close call for this Chatham man, a recent heart attack on the ice has him and others calling for greater precautions. In your weather, cloudy and six degrees right now. Periods of rain tonight turning into snow with more of that white stuff tomorrow. Your full weather forecast is coming up a little later in the show. Good evening, I'm Jason Vio. Chris is off tonight. Well, the start of next week may be a difficult one for those who rely on public transit. Now, come Monday, there could be no buses running at all, and that would be the first time that's happened in about 30 years. This afternoon, Transit Windsor put out a warning to its ridership, saying they may need to find another way to get around. The CBC's Stacey Janzer joins us live tonight from the downtown Windsor bus terminal. Stacey, what's going on here? Well, Jason, the riders I talked to today say they were shocked to know that the buses like the ones here behind me may not be on the roads next week. Transit Windsor says the union representing the transit workers will be in a strike position come Monday at 2 in the morning. Now, they're still in negotiations, but if agreement isn't reached in the next 72 hours, that means a regular service will stop. That includes a tunnel bus, busing to high schools and service throughout Essex County. And for the riders who rely on the service, the idea they won't have it come Monday is preposterous. This really is gonna strike on Monday? You are working and then no bus. How can you go there? Like, <laughs> you're stuck in one place. Uh, my husband will gonna drop me off in, during the, the morning and then I gonna take the bus, but sometimes I have to ask my friend to, you know, or I gonna ask my daughter or someone to pick me up. It means that nobody's getting to work, nobody's getting home, no, people are going to go starving because they can't get to the grocery store. I live in the West End and I have to take a 20 minute bus just to get to the store. So if the buses aren't running, then I'm screwed. It'd be horrible. It's my only way to get around. I'm in a wheelchair and um, we have ramps. I just found out about it from you guys. So it would have been a complete surprise if I came down here. I really depend on it. Like I used to ride Handy Transit, but I can't right now because I have back problems and they're, um, the bumps kill me so it's just around here and I can't afford a cab so I don't know what I'm gonna do I'm glad you guys told me I cannot go to work I cannot buy my food I cannot go sit in the garden somewhere like it's a basic thing for someone who doesn't have a car and it's difficult to walk in this weather so Stacey sounds like some people are really going to be scrambling if this happens on Monday so what are the real issues here though well, Jason, we don't really know because neither side is really talking right now, but Pat Delmore, he's the executive director for Transit Windsor, did put out a statement in part saying Transit Windsor regrets the inconvenience a strike would cause our riders. However, we are hopeful that ongoing discussions will result in an agreement. We hope this advance notice will allow time for preparations to be made that will help minimize the impact as much as possible. Now, we also reached out to the union, but they haven't yet got back to us. And CBC will continue to update you on this potential strike. Keep your eyes posted on our website. Jason. All right, thank you so much, Stacy. The CBC's Stacy Janzer live tonight. And take a look at this video from our archives. This was the last time Transit Windsor went on strike back in 1991. That strike stretched out for two months over the summer with the city and workers at an impasse over their contracts, leaving residents without any bus service. Public schools in Windsor-Essex may be out of session on Wednesday. The Greater Essex County District School Board will be one of eight school boards across the province participating in this strike action. The Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation says the goal is to pressure the province to resume contract talks. A one-day strike will move forward if the union is unable to reach a deal with the provincial government before Wednesday. It would mark the second strike from teachers here in Windsor-Essex in about a month. And the province announced just over $3 million in special infrastructure funding for three hospitals in Windsor and Essex County today. Just over $931,000 is going to Hotel Du Grace Hospital. 
Chatham Kent Leamington MPP Rick Nichols made the announcement today. The money will go towards things like windows and a new nurse call system at Hotel DuGrace Healthcare. Erie Shores Healthcare in Leamington is getting a new is getting some new sterilization equipment, and Windsor Regional Hospital is getting heating and cooling upgrades there. Now the money at Windsor Regional is going to fix aging equipment, something that won't be a problem once the new hospital is built. But Nichols says the province can't move forward with the next phase of the new mega hospital until the issue over the location is finalized. Location, I understand, uh, can be a, an issue right now, uh, but I also understand that a decision had been made. Uh, there are, uh, no pun intended, two camps uh, involved in this. And of course, uh, once uh, all of that is finalized, then we can move ahead. And of course, uh, with the proper acquisitions and uh, environmental assessments and those types of things. Now, the group opposing the hospital location is seeking to appeal a tribunal decision upholding that location on County Road 42 near Windsor's airport. MPP Lisa Gretzky, however, says the province could be moving forward with some aspects of phase two. She wants to see the province cut through some of the red tape. Alton C. Parker Park in downtown Windsor brings back happy childhood memories for one Windsor man, but he says the park, which honors a Windsor police detective, isn't being properly maintained, and he says, for that reason, discourages people from visiting it. The CBC's Tamina Aziz has those details. Growing up, Michael Cosma would spend hours at Alton C. Parker Park with the kids in his neighborhood. Now he drives by the area, disappointed by how empty it is. This park used to be filled to the rim. My biggest concern is the fact that this park is surrounded by public housing. Public housing is where, you know, the poor families live and I'm not trying to break, put them down, but they deserve to be able to let their kids come out here on their own and play like I used to. My mom would be at home and I'd be out here at five, six, seven years old with everybody else from the neighborhood. You don't see that anymore in the city. And it's five blocks from city council. It's in the heart of the city. And I'm sick and tired of seeing it like this. Another local resident says she's noticed a decline in people visiting the park within the last five years. When I first moved in, there was a little splash area, kids with water and a slide. And, and there was a lot of people every day during the summer and sometimes in the wintertime. And it was an attraction. It's not an attraction anymore. The park hasn't received any noticeable upgrades within the last 15 years, which the city says is typical. Our, our parks, you know, tend to uh, receive uh, major upgrades, you know, really only once every 25 to 30 years. Uh, you know, small things like benches or lighting might be updated as, as they require from a maintenance standpoint. He says people need to be patient as Alton C. Parker Park will be one of 25 parks that will be upgraded by 2024. The city will be installing a new playground within the next three to five years that will be bigger, brighter and more accessible, similar to Parent Park. Cosma says he's happy to hear about the new playground, but hopes the city can work on fixing the benches in the meantime. Tamina Aziz, CBC News, Windsor. A beer league organizer is calling on others to get more prepared. Days before Christmas, his pickup hockey team dealt with its second heart attack on the ice, and he's hoping other teams start planning for health emergencies. Here's Stacey Janzer again with more on what changes they're making. I probably did not even have the power to try to grab my phone. So it's a good story because uh, there was somebody there. Guy Briere loves to play hockey. He's done it since he was three, even trying out for the Pittsburgh Penguins in the 70s. Even now, recovering from his heart attack, he's watching hockey. But it was a close call on December 21st after playing in a pickup league. I'm a good skater. And I go there and I try to do a rush, come back and I get sore everywhere. My arm gets sore, tired, and my leg gets tired, and I didn't know why. They play in a one-rink arena from 10.30 to midnight on Saturdays. So Briere got off the ice and went to sit in the front area. Luckily, there was a woman there watching, and after he got worse, she called 911. Other players got off the ice and had the defibrillator ready. The scene wasn't new for the organizer. It's the second time he's dealt with a player having a heart attack and wants others to be prepared. He was going to the uh, dressing room by himself. He should never let anybody go to the direct locker room by himself. You're not feeling well, something bad could happen. We're getting older. 
Uh, the other lesson we learned is we don't have contact lists for any of our players. Now he's more organized. He knows who's trained in CPR, keeps his cell phone on the bench, and makes sure he knows where the defibrillator is located. Now when DeLine gets ready to go to hockey, he feels he's ready to help if needed. And he hopes this story encourages other teams to form a plan of their own. Stacey Janzer, CBC News, Chatham. Chocolate, chewables, and cookies. Starting next week, pot users are going to have more choice when they walk into an Ontario cannabis store. The CBC's Lauren Pelly has more on these new offerings. Starting Monday, all these cannabis products will be legal across the province. And within weeks, the Ontario Cannabis Store says they'll be ready to buy online and on store shelves. We know that Ontarian adults have been waiting for these products for a long period of time. The prices range from more than 100 bucks for some vaping products to under $16 for candy edibles. There are 59 products in total in this latest offering. Everything from vapes to gummies to chocolates and cookies and even a cannabis tea. We're, we're really excited that, that these are going to help us combat the legal market. Uh, a lot more effectively. But will customers make the switch? Right now, government-sold edibles can contain up to 10 milligrams of THC, lining up with Health Canada regulations. At illicit shops, you can find products with 10 times the potency for around the same price. 10 milligrams is the max? <laughs> I'm sorry, that's just funny. People we spoke to say regulated products can't compare to the black market. They have like more potent uh, cannabis and sometimes it's cheaper. I mean, it's definitely cheaper than the government shops. Sometimes the governmental products are not as like authentic maybe or they just don't have as much of an effect or they're just, I find them just a little bit more overpriced for like the actual product. I have this feeling about, about it though that um, rolling out uh, sanctioned cannabis sales has not been pretty well thought through. So far, the OCS has struggled with delivery delays and lost tens of millions of dollars in the last fiscal year, despite launching a website and multiple bricks and mortar stores. Now officials warn their latest offerings could sell out quick. There will be very limited supply uh, when it comes to the variety of products as well as the quantity. More products will keep hitting the market in the months ahead, giving customers time to figure out if government vapes and edibles are worth the cash or just a buzzkill. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. Tehran says it will have a harsh response to a U.S. airstrike overnight, the targeted killing of a top Iranian general. It marks a dramatic escalation of tensions between Washington and Iran. Now, the drone strike by the U.S. happened near Baghdad airport soon after Qasem Soleimani arrived in Iraq. Iran's state TV says a total of 10 people were killed in the attack. Soleimani was the head of Iran's elite military force. He was seen as the second most powerful figure in the country after its supreme leader. Soleimani was also considered a key player in Tehran's growing military influence in the Middle East. And President Donald Trump is defending that U.S. airstrike that killed Iran's top general, calling it a response to an imminent threat. Jacqueline Hansen has more from Washington. We took action last night to stop a war. We did not take action to start a war. The airstrike was necessary, according to U.S. officials, to eliminate an imminent threat on the lives of Americans in the Middle East. President Trump says he personally ordered the attack to take out the man orchestrating that threat. Under my leadership, America's policy is unambiguous to terrorists who harm or intend to harm any American. We will find you. We will eliminate you. President Trump has been sending strong signals to Iran all week. After the U.S. claims an Iran-backed militia killed an American in a rocket attack. In Washington, reaction to last night's strike has largely been divided along party lines. Republicans are praising Trump's decision to stand up to Iran. But there is concern among Democrats that the killing of such a senior leader will destabilize the region. The risk of a much longer military engagement in the Middle East is acute and immediate. This action may well have brought our nation closer to another endless war. 
exactly the kind of endless war the President promised he would not drag us into. The operation that led to Soleimani's death may prove controversial or divisive. Although I anticipate and welcome a debate about America's interest in foreign policy in the Middle East, I recommend that all senators wait to review the facts and hear from the administration before passing much public judgment. The U.S. deployed more than 700 troops to the Middle East last week, and today it announced it would send 3,000 more as a precautionary measure. The reinforcement reflects the new concern over potential retaliation to the killing, but it also appears to contradict Trump's often repeated calls to pull the United States out of conflicts in the Middle East. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Washington. And just a note here as we go to break, you may have experienced some service disruptions occasionally both on CBC TV and radio, and that's because crews are working on a new television antenna and transmission lines in our region. Now, weather delays have pushed that project back. It's expected to be done by January the 10th. And still to come here on CBC Windsor News, after the break, we'll give you your full weather forecast. Stay with us.
And Nick Cernkovich joins us live now for a look at weather. Nick, I kind of told my two little ones at home that we might be able to build a snowman <laughs> maybe in the next couple of days. And they're what saying empty promises, Dad. Empty oh, promises. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, it's not going to be a lot of snow. Um, I, I don't want to say unfortunately, really, it's subjective, right? I mean, I like the snowfall, I have to admit. But uh, anyway, we should see some flurries and maybe some light snow across the region, but we're not looking at big accumulations just yet. We haven't really got over that hump yet. Temperatures are just too warm, um, and we're missing a lot of uh, the sort of bigger snowfalls that we tend to see. Uh, we're sitting right now at 5 degrees uh, in Windsor. That's well above the season mark. To kind of put this in perspective, the average daytime high is closer to about minus 1 the average low is closer to about minus 7, and we hit 5 degrees today. Uh, last night, uh, also very mild as well. Light winds today, making it for a nice day. Um, this comes under cloud cover, though, across the region. And what we're tracking here is another system that's coming up from the south. This is the one that uh, we're thinking could bring some snowfall to the region. As it pushes uh, further to the north and colder air is sort of dragged in, we're actually going to see some of this develop into snowfall as we move through the uh, overnight period. So this is what we're looking at. As it slides across, although most of it uh, sort of closer to about Long Point eastward, um, down to where the Windsor area it really just looks like some wet flurries in the forecast for tonight and tomorrow as well. And then into Sunday, Sunday might be a better chance. It starts out uh, sunny or at least partly sunny, and then a clipper moves through. This might be a better chance of seeing some snowfall, but again, I don't think it's going to be much. We're looking at maybe a centimeter or two. For tomorrow's system, as I mentioned, most of it is actually to the east of us. Uh, Windsor looks to be accumulation-wise closer to about zero trace amounts. Um, this looks bad. It's not. It's just sort of a mix of wet flurries. Same story into tomorrow. Some wet flurries. Temperatures at 2 degrees. Long range forecast. Here's how it plays out. We've got a pair of twos for Saturday and Sunday. These are just flurries. Nothing really accumulating. Some sunshine Monday. Tuesday could be interesting though. It doesn't look at this point that we're going to see accumulations with it. it. Might be a bit too warm. But a slight shift in the system could make your kids pretty happy. We'll have All right, to keep so an eye on it. <laughs> so I guess I'll have to keep the carrots for Frosty's Just, nose yeah, and the fridge yeah, for a little bit longer. Well, yeah, you're dangling the carrot in front of them. But uh. <laughs> Seriously. Okay. Thanks, Nick. Have a yeah, great weekend. You too. And our weather photo today is from Frank. Check this one out. He captured this year's first sunset, he says, along the Lake Erie shoreline. You can see those glowing icicles just dangling in the tree and the frozen ice pellets on the ground, possibly from those waves crashing up against the rocks there. Now, you can send us your best weather snapshot taken anywhere in Windsor, Essex, and it could be our next weather photo of the day, or you can post it on our Facebook page, on our wall, email us directly, windsor at cbc.ca, or tag us on Instagram or Twitter. Twitter at CBC Windsor. Well, still to come, the Me Too movement has prompted some changes in the acting world. That story is coming up next.
In Australia, scorching temperatures and high winds are forecast to spike tomorrow, further fueling wildfires that have already ravaged 5 million hectares of land. Officials in the country's most populous state say while they're focused on protecting lives, it's pretty much a certainty that more homes will be consumed by the fire. It's likely we'll see some areas during the day reach that catastrophic forecast, um, particularly in the southern part of New South Wales. Um, and obviously we're gearing up to that. Whilst it's rated extreme, it's in the upper end of extreme. So, um, you know, it's, it's going to be a bad day. Authorities say many locals and most of the tourists in popular coastal areas got out yesterday. Those remaining are being told they will not be able to count on the timely arrival of fire trucks. And they've been warned that trying to drive away will not be safe once the fires barrel in. In neighboring Victoria, preparations for the coming inferno saw military personnel plucking people from beaches to safety at sea. And the Me Too movement has forced the film and TV industry to shift how it operates. One of the changes, the hiring of intimacy coordinators. They are trained experts who ensure safe spaces for actors during intimate shoots. HBO introduced a mandatory requirement for them on set, and it's now becoming the norm. The CBC's Tashana Reed has that story. Three, two, one. It can be an embrace, a kiss between two actors, or the depiction of sex. Embrace. You can go cheek to cheek, which is how I, I like to do rehearsals, really putting the weight on one another without intimately kissing. Mm -hmm. For Lindsay Summers, her job is to make sure on-set intimacy is comfortable for everyone before the cameras start rolling. Wait. Summers is an intimacy coordinator. She's part of a growing field of trained experts sought after by film and TV productions to ensure actors feel safe performing intimate scenes. That's my motto is just no surprises. We should be we should have a very clear plan before we get to set about what's going to happen. In a recent interview, actor Amelia Clark spoke about terrifying nude sex scenes on the first season of Game of Thrones. Actor Selma Hayek wrote about being pressured by film producer Harvey Weinstein into a nude sex scene in the film Frida. But the industry, post Me Too, is showing change. In 2019, Summers and her business partner Casey Hudecki worked on 30 film and TV sets in Toronto alone. And HBO, Amazon Prime and Netflix now require intimacy coordinators on their sets. Can I hold your hands? Yes. Intimacy coordinators meet with the director to discuss the degree of nudity, wardrobe and choreography for the intimate scene. We are including the performer's personal boundaries into the choreography and into the structure of what we're doing. We're not expecting them to be puppets or chess pieces. Are you comfortable with Umberly's hands on your shoulders? Okay. And For young actor Umberly Gonzalez, having an intimacy coordinator helps her feel confident in vulnerable scenes. Choreographing every single movement, it makes you look at the scene technically and then emotionally. So I'm not just improvising where I'm going to touch or where I'm going to move. For most of actor Liz Whitmere's career, she's never worked with an intimacy coordinator. Certainly when I've been on set and felt compromised, it's usually because of a last minute change. And then I arrive at set and there's been a last minute rewrite and all of a sudden I'm not wearing pants. Whitmere's first experience with an intimacy coordinator was this year with Summers on the Netflix show Designated Survivor. It meant that I was free to do my job, which was just be in the scene, just be an actor. Intimacy coordinators say they want to see the same rigor that goes into fight scenes and stunts applied to intimate scenes too. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. Well, it's 629 here in the CBC Windsor Newsroom. That does it for us. Thank you so much for watching. And don't forget for news anytime, head to our website, cbc.ca slash Windsor. And don't forget we're on social media as well. Check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just for Laughs Gags is coming up next. Have a great night and a great weekend.